Good afternoon. Welcome to the third day of the American Philosophical Society's virtual symposium, Evidence, the Use and Abuse of Data. I'm glad that so many of you have been able to join us today. My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at the APS. This afternoon's 1 p.m. panel is the third panel of our symposium, and it's entitled Making Data, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. For those of you joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The society has long been a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, arts and the humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over $1 million in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Given the many different ways that our founder, Benjamin Franklin, used evidence and information in his scientific research, in his publishing, and in his diplomatic work, we felt this week's conference on the use and abuse of data in the past, present, and looking ahead to the future would be particularly fitting. Before I introduce our uh, moderator for today's panel, let me just say a few words about the format. Speakers are gonna talk for eight to 10 minutes about their work. Now, you can read their full papers, uh, which are available on the APS website. Uh, you, we will post in the chat box the link to that and the password for accessing them. After their presentations, uh, our moderator commenter will begin the conversation with some quick thoughts uh, and some questions for each of our presenters. We'll then turn it over to questions from the audience. And we wanna make sure that we leave a good 20 to 30 minutes for all of you out there watching this to ask your questions. To do that, we ask that you use the Q&A function, which is at the very bottom of the navigation bar uh, for in your Zoom screen. Ask a question at any time. Ask it when it comes up. Uh, you don't need to wait till the end. Uh, we will be collecting all those questions uh, and then we will be using them, as I said, to structure our question and answer period. We also hope that the dialogue won't happen just today in this panel, but will also bleed over into social media. So as you can see on your screen, we're using the conference hashtag APS Evidence. And if you post something that you want to get other people to think about it, uh, please use uh, also cite us, uh, Amphil Society on Twitter, Amphil Society on Instagram, uh, or also connect to our Facebook page. Our hope is uh, we are recording this uh, lecture and that afterwards we will post the video on YouTube. Uh, so please, uh, we look forward to you uh, continuing the dialogue that starts today. So now let me introduce our commenter. It is Sarah E. Igo, the Andrew Jackson Professor of American History and Director of American Studies at Vanderbilt University. With, and she has affiliate appointments at the university also in law, political science, and sociology. Igo is the professor of two prize, is the author of two prize winning books, The Averaged American, Surveys, Citizens, and the Making of a Mass Public, which is published by Harvard in 2007, and The Known Citizen, A History of Privacy in Modern America, which was also published by Harvard only in 2018. Uh, the Known Citizen recently won the Jacques Barzon Prize in Cultural History from the American Philosophical Society. So congratulations, Sarah. She teaches and writes about modern American intellectual, cultural, legal, and political history, and she has research interests in the production of knowledge, the politics of data, human sciences, and the history of privacy and the public sphere. Sarah generously served on the program committee for this conference, and we couldn't think of a better person to be the commenter today. So I will now turn it over to Sarah to introduce our speakers for the day. Okay, I think I'm live, is that right? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, thank you so much to Kyle for the kind introduction um, and welcome to everybody uh, to this third in um, a week long array of really wonderful panels uh, on evidence, uh, its uses, misuses, abuses, and so on. Uh, I wanna begin by thanking everyone at the American Philosophical Society, uh, to Kyle, of course, uh, but also particularly to Adriana Link uh, for convening us on a new platform in very challenging circumstances uh, so expertly. Uh, they've, uh, as always, been a, a real pleasure to work with. Um, and I think uh, we are learning all kinds of new things about how to do these things well online. And I, I really wanna thank them for their work on um, pulling this together. 
Um, as Kyle mentioned, I had the pleasure of getting to participate on the uh, crafting of the program for this week. Uh, and I can tell you uh, for that reason uh, that you're really uh, in for a treat this next hour. Uh, these are wonderful papers and I encourage you to read them in their full uh, versions. Um, our panel is called Making Data, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, I uh, will uh, let the meanings of that title unfold as the hour goes on. Um, uh, and for now, I'm simply going to introduce in brief our three panelists. Uh, our first panelist is Sarah J. Grossman, who is a poet as well as an assistant professor of environmental studies at Bryn Mawr College. Uh, her work has been published in many venues, uh, and she also had a first book of poems published uh, in October of 2018 by New Issues Poetry and Prose. She is currently at work on an academic monograph titled A Natural History of Data, Measuring American Weather from 1820 to Hurricane Sandy. Our second speaker today will be Alex Kindle. Uh, he is a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology at Princeton University. Uh, and Alex conducts research on uh, a wonderful array of topics on the social organization of expertise, the history of rationalization, and the politics of highly technical modes of knowing. Alex's dissertation narrates the development of social science methodology in the United States since the 1940s. And finally, Lindsay Grubbs is a Hecht Levy postdoctoral fellow at the Berman Institute for Bioethics at Johns Hopkins University. She holds a PhD in English from Emory University uh, and has a background in feminist disability studies and the health humanities uh, with a special interest as you'll see in psychiatry and neurology. This fall, uh, she'll begin a position as assistant professor in the Department of Health Sciences at California State University, East Bay. And I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists now. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here and thank you to the American Philosophical Society, Adriana and Kyle, for doing the work of shifting this um, to a virtual format. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm a poet and a cultural historian. I'm writing and working on the unceded land of the Nanticoke and Lenape peoples, and I ask that you join me in acknowledging the Nanticoke and Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations in this moment. This acknowledgement is a commitment to the beginning of the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I'd like to use my first minute of this presentation to highlight the demands for justice that have grown out of the Philly We Rise movement, as well as the Black Lives Matter movement in Philadelphia, a movement that many here have marched in the streets for over the last two weeks. Slide. You can learn more about these demands at phillyweRise.com. I'm reading here directly from their movement documents. No more money for the police. We must reject any budget proposal that increases money for the police and move towards reallocating police budget towards programs that keep our communities safe. Keep Black communities in their homes. We need to pass the Emergency Housing Protection Act to ensure immediate relief for renters facing evictions, increased rents and late fees, especially for Black women being hit hardest by, hardest by the COVID crisis. Fund our communities. We know that when our communities have basic programs like fully funded schools, libraries, rec centers, the arts and athletics, our children thrive. The wealthy should pay their fair share. An austerity budget is a choice. When we know that there is still extreme wealth in our city, we need to make sure everyone is paying their share by raising the gross receipts tax, reinstating the personal property tax, and making universities like Penn pay pilots protect black workers. Black communities, working class people have been on the front lines of the COVID crisis. We've seen that here with sanitation workers and we need to be, uh, they need to be protected on the job. We need to expand paid sick leave so that all low income workers are protected. Thank you. 
I'm here today to talk about bad data and specifically the emergence of bad data in the environmental history of the United States circa 1930 to 1940 slide. I wanted to start off by offering a networked picture of where this concern around bad data sits. And it sits within a much larger project that I'm working on, uh, which is an environmental history of weather data in the United States. And the way that I've come to build this larger environmental history, which is a two century story about the popularization of data in the United States, has been by asking how particular types of settler colonial tactics and territorial claims were furthered and supported by institutional and grassroots science. And that's taken me back to the 1820s where the language of meteorological data begins to emerge among soon to be professionalized communities of scientists and meteorological volunteers. Um, it's also taken me uh, well into the late 20th and early 21st century where you can see here. I want to underscore that this is not a history of institutions, although institutions are central characters. It's a history about networked volunteer communities and is then a portrait of how data became a popular notion and a fundamental category within the settler context and especially the settler environmental imagination. Settler environmental data played a key role in claims to territory. In fact, the earliest settler measurements we have from Nebraska come from army forts in the unceded lands of the Dakota and Lakota peoples. Weather recording traveled hand in hand with illegal occupation of indigenous territory. These weather records that I'm mentioning form the basis of contemporary US climate archives, so they reach well into the present. Slide. I'm zooming in on a 1930s moment, the decade of the Dust Bowl, which sits around these um, two additional moments, uh, which have to do with the emergence of the language of clean data um, and discourses around sustaining data. Uh, slide. Bad data, which I'm talking about today, is bad because it's incomplete in this period. And it's a product of uneven distribution of meteorological data collection stations, in addition to some other things I'll speak about today. Slide. Bad data also signals the failure of quantification schema, so the failure of rubrics or categories of measurement. Data failures preoccupy me because they shed light on glitches in data capture. These glitches are keys. They can be read in relief as maps of ideological systems of the past, especially ideological systems that undergird territorial settler claims. Slide. During the Dust Bowl, Weather Bureau employees and volunteers in the United States used a fairly historic weather data form to render the meteorological crisis of dust. These are some sample forms. These first two are from the 19th century and the second two slide are from the 20th century. This kind of form posed uh, passed between many institutions from the Albany Academy in upstate New York to the Smithsonian, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of War slide. By the 1930s, two different kinds of forms were used for data collection, one for Weather Bureau employees and one for volunteers. <clears throat> Both Bureau employees and cooperative observers or volunteers needed to work within the confines of existing categorical arrangements on their weather data sheets for measuring dust, though neither sheet included a dust measurement column. Slide. The following two examples are from April 8, 1935, a month with one of the worst dust storms of the Dust Bowl crisis. And I'm not sure if they're coming up on everyone else's screen. Um, my screen is blank, but I'm just going to keep going um, and reference that uh, these forms are also available in the paper, which you can download on the website. I'm hoping this is just my computer glitching. Um, these forms show how dust permeated several columns on the data blank, finding no permanent home within any of them. Dust description gets incorporated into the miscellaneous phenomena column, as well as the remarks column, columns designated for anom anomalies and further explanation. Dust data oscillated between the remarks column, the precipitation column, as well as the wind and the state of the weather at time of observation column. It also moved between the graphical and the lexical register. 
um, dust was categorically messy in different ways for official station agents who used a different form for measurement, a form that allowed for greater data capture. And I think the slides might not be working, um, but these are the, uh, ah, this is, these are some of the forms. <laughs> um, if we're able to move on to um, the next slide and possibly the following, I, I think that would catch us up. Um, so at the official Weather Bureau station in Dodge City, Kansas, notations indicating dust appeared in the hourly sunshine log for the month. And I think that's one slide further. So in order to render dust data um, in this column, the observer created a shorthand, a symbol, to indicate when dust was present. And this symbol appears over 40 times across the observer's monthly records within the columns designated for sunshine. The symbol is repeatable and standardizable within the closed system of this particular observer's weather data records. Slide. Dust Bowl data collection reveals what happens when measurement inf infrastructures encounter events and materials, dust storms and dust, that they weren't designed for. These forms were never meant to capture dust, yet in these attempts to measure, we see how dust fell into the edges of the form um, or were invented via various symbols. They often fell into the corners of precipitation and sunshine, record boxes, the margins of miscellaneous phenomena. Studying bad data, incomplete or murky measurement here, as I'm interested in, allows us to see a fundamental disjuncture between historic forms of colonial scientific capture and complex earth systems. It signals, in the words of Kyle Powis White, toward a fundamental environmental injustice whereby, quote, settlers lack of long-term knowledge of the environments they inhabit, even years after settlement, have transformed the ecological conditions in ways that are not sustainable for settlers, indigenous peoples, or anyone else. So data capture, weather crisis, and settler colonialism converge in the Dust Bowl period. And this is the story of the weather blank. It's the story that the form tells in its bad or messy renderings. To close, land-based data collectors treated dust discreetly as an object to be studied rather than as a subject to be understood in relation. And relationality is key, but a missing component in this decade period. Data capture upheld notions of bounded object-oriented environmental ideology. At the same time, bad data pushed Weather Bureau employees toward notions of vertical weather data, which is where the next segment of this work takes off, rather than simply horizontal ones. Um, and that roughly coincided with World War II um, aerial technology. The upper edges of land-based data led toward the lower edges of upper air data. Dust obstructed the bureaus and the public's capacity to conceive of weather as infinitely quantifiable. Bad ground data led to vertical and relational air data, a data collection practice that attempted to connect, it the, way, to connect the ways in which dust storms were bound, not to a single category on the data sheet, but rather to every single one. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks. So um, before I get started, I just wanted to thank uh, Adriana Wink for organizing, um, as well as my fellow panelists for sharing their extremely interesting work. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that I'm giving this talk in Gainesville, Florida, on the traditional land of the Timucua people. Um, and I also want to affirm that Black Lives Matter. So my topic for today is data cleaning. Um, and normally at the start of a talk, we would define the main thing we're talking about. Um, but if you were to look around for a definition of data cleaning in, say, the methodological journals of the social sciences, you would undoubtedly come up short. Um, in fact, as the sociologist Aaron Leahy has shown in a series of papers, there is broad agreement among experts that data cleaning standards not only do not exist, but also that such standards would be undesirable or even impossible to make in the first place. Um, and in light of this widespread dissensus, we might reasonably conclude that the defining feature of data cleaning is that it is, well, undefined. Um, or uh, perhaps to be a bit more specific, we might say that data cleaning simply has no abstract general knowledge base of its own. Um, so there are many data cleaning methods and tools to be sure, but there is no methodological theory of data cleaning as such. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so I think that this absence of a theory of data cleaning is actually really exciting um, because it gives us a chance to learn something broader about the practical work that goes into making social knowledge. Um, so as the historians Londa Schiebinger and Robert Proctor have argued, studying what is ignored and what is not known provides us with a powerful tool for investigating the submerged and taken for granted distinctions that organize much of the social world. So what kind of absence is this? Um, some possibilities are actually pretty easy for us to rule out. Um, so data cleaning is not a tightly kept secret and its existence is not in doubt. Um, it's not a case of mistaken knowledge and it's not something that we've forgotten how to do. Um, and indeed, data cleaning isn't something that we don't know how to do at all. Um, to borrow one estimate from the statistician David Donahoe, around 80% of data analysis is spent on the process of cleaning and preparing the data. So as a matter of fact, we do it all the time, we just don't produce theory about it. Um, so I think the key word here is actually we, who cleans data and who produces theory. Uh, to a substantial extent, data cleaning is the type of epistemic work that the sociologist Julius Roth called hired hand research, uh, what Steve Shapin has called the work of the invisible technician, and uh, what social scientists refer to in the acknowledgments of their papers as research assistants. Uh, so these workers take the raw or dirty material of observational work and transform them into the regularized categories of social thought. Um, and the theorizing that this type of work this type of work enables is the signature work of ac academic professionals. So disciplines are suborganized according to theoretical distinctions, not distinctions of data, and contributions to social science are contributions to some sort of theory. So in comparison, cleaning data does not in general entitle the cleaner to authorship on the resulting publications. Um, the tasks that constitute it are widely understood as menial and repetitive work rather than intellectual work. Uh, but that said, they're also widely understood as necessary. Um, so while it might be possible for a single social scientist to do all this work on their own, it is unlikely that they could do so at the pace usually expected of academic professionals. So one way that we might understand the absence of a theory of data cleaning then is to point to its status within this division of labor, expert labor. So as a category of practice, data cleaning is not just undefined. Uh, so, uh, so what I want to argue instead is that data cleaning is a residual category. So there's theory, there's observation, and then there's some other stuff. Um, and like all residual categories, uh, data cleaning is inherently ambiguous and is in fact productive by virtue of its ambiguity. Being ambiguously defined allows data cleaning to hold much of the submerged technical work that makes theorizing from observations possible. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that's important to note here is that this distinction between theory and observation has been extremely important for the historical development of the social sciences. So regardless of what our stance is on the question and debate of scientific realism, the basic idea that these are two different categories is central to the definition and practice of modern science. Um, and so to the extent that they claim the status of science, the disciplinary social sciences are officially in the business of producing theoretical knowledge. And these fields have in fact worked very hard historically to distinguish themselves from fields that say advocate for the underprivileged or from fields that build and maintain data systems. Um, but to a significant extent, the social sciences can never be completely free from challenges to their objectivity. Because the social sciences are dependent on things like grounded experience or longitudinal surveys or other external sources of data, they're subject to both external control as well as internal conflict over their adherence to this very specific model of objectivity. As a consequence of this commitment, the social sciences, particularly at their more dominant poles, have worked very hard to enact theory and observation as distinct epistemic categories. So to briefly zoom out and contextualize a little bit, in my dissertation project, I'm working to trace the development of the field of methodology around this increasingly institutionalized separation of theory from observation. So as Professor Stigler reminded us on Monday, um, since the early decades of the 20th century, statisticians have been warning the world about the dangers of misusing and misinterpreting statistical tools. And part of what I'm trying to uncover with this project is the long history of methodologists taking up this style of knowledge and trying to use it and make it matter in areas of applied statistical practice. So methodological knowledge, in short, is the history of reasoning around the limitations of statistical tools as devices for theoretical knowing. So data cleaning is really interesting to me from this perspective because it's an excellent example of the kind of work that methodology does. So it is the practical mechanism through which the core distinctions of modern science are sustained and enacted, particularly in a field where enacting them is consequential for the organization of professional status. So my provocation is that we should think of data cleaning in terms of how it enacts this distinction, rather than as say a well articulated kind of work that involves performing a defined set of tasks. Uh, next slide please. So to understand how data cleaning does this work, in the paper I offer the metaphor of polishing, 
Um, so I think the polishing has three connotations of interest. Um, so one, uh, polishing involves smoothing away things. So it involves getting rid of things like protrusions, dents, or other imperfections on the surface of, of an object. So to polish an object in some sense is to render it a more perfect version of the geometric form it is trying to be. Um, you can imagine, say, uh, the process of making a bowling ball as a form of polishing. Uh, so analogously, data cleaning involves adjusting the features of a data set such that they are recognizable as regular mathematical objects. Uh, second, pol polishing involves rendering a service more reflective. So polishing in this sense means creating a mirror or something. Um, evoking Richard Rorty, perhaps, uh, to clean data might mean to make it into a mirror of nature. Uh, so when we clean data, we reproduce data into representations that stand in for the theoretical entities which we wish to understand. Finally, polishing is something that is defined by its final product. To put it very simply, polishing has happened when something is polished. In practice, getting this work done involves a heterogeneous set of tools. It usually does not matter much to the end user of a bowling ball or a mirror how the object was made. Um, so whatever works to get the data clean is acceptable. And um, so before I run out of time, I just want to um, sort of briefly allude to what I think are some of the observable consequences of this metaphor and the evidence that I used to explore them in the second half of the paper. Um, so first I want to suggest that data cleaning is simultaneously about both producing mathematically regular objects and producing theoretically crisp categories. So data cleaning endows math with theoretical meaning, but also endows theory with mathematical meaning. Second, and perhaps somewhat paradoxically, I want to argue that data cleaning is an essentially anarchic practice. So although there may be a limited set of tools that are typically used to clean data, there are, for example, no limits on the order in which they are to be applied, and no rules about which must be used together or separately. We should expect to find little to none of these types of constraints at the level of disciplines or even subfields within disciplines when it comes to data cleaning. In short, anything goes. Uh, so in the second half of the paper, uh, which is sort of not attached to the one that is uh, online, unfortunately, um, I assess whether these theoretical observations hold in the field of economics. Um, and to do so, I introduce a corpus of data analysis code published alongside articles in the American Economic Review since the mid-2000s. Um, and although these, uh, these code records are by no means complete, they illustrate the breadth of technical practice that typically goes unstated in written academic research. Uh, I think that code provides a actually fairly detailed window into the minute technical details of economic data analysis and provides us with a way of reasoning about the relative level of order or disorder that constitutes data cleaning. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks to everyone for being here. Thanks to Adriana and APS for hosting us um, and to my fellow panelists. Um, I today am gonna talk about early 19th century American psychiatry. So in the early 19th century US, the professionalization of psychiatry was achieved in part through the rather successful argument that law required the services of experts in not just medicine, but the medicine of the mind. And this argument hinged on the success of another Madness wasn't only total and obvious alienation from reason, but could take many forms difficult to detect. So only specialists could draw the lines between, for example, simulated insanity, hidden insanity, partial insanity, where you're mad on only one subject, uh, moral insanity, which we would now think of as um, like emotional rather than intellectual disorder. And many kinds of data circulated in the early years of psychiatry as information about patients was gathered and tabulated. This paper, though, examines the use of narrative as data in the development of American psychiatry, asking how subjective stories were transformed into objective fact and how this strange kind of data enabled the growth of the field. Um, slide, please. I focus here primarily on asylum physician Isaac Ray's foundational 1838 treatise on the medical jurisprudence of insanity. The text was influential in the United States and England, going through five editions in four decades, and he became a popular expert witness arguing for the expansion of the insanity defense. He rejected the qualifications of most physicians, asserting the need for professional expertise grounded in practical experience, um, but reading, it seems, was practical enough. Slide, please. Um, he assures his readers that his controversial claims are based on well-observed, well-authenticated facts. These observations were not personally authenticated. He translated medical texts 
from across Europe, gathering other cases from history books, newspaper articles, and fictionalized accounts. Some of these cases were multiply translated. So he translates a French text by Gaul, in which Gaul is translating a German news story. Um, he writes that illustrative cases provide every honest and unprejudiced inquirer a kind of information which he can obtain from no other quarter and will allow the reader to, quote, see for himself, gaining firsthand sensory experience, secondhand, or even third or fourth hand, as the cases he cites were often themselves borrowed. Ray's bid for expertise relies on seeing these cases as data, which he pits against simple facts. Slide, please. Uneducated juries are not capable of deciding between competing expert testimony because diagnosis is not quote, purely a matter of facts, but on the contrary, it is a matter of inference to be drawn from certain data and thus is a professional question of a most delicate nature. So professionals are necessary to process data into the facts that can be used by lay people and case data becomes the raw immutable information to be aggregated and reasoned into actionable knowledge. One outcome of Ray's data science was anatomical. He believed that proper jurisprudence required understanding insanity as a brain disease, but autopsies only occasionally revealed lesions. Still, he wrote that it would be absurd to think that this meant the disorder wasn't organic. To prove physiological disorder without anatomical evidence, Ray instead relied on narratives of behavior. Stories of personality change could demonstrate, quote, pathological changes in the action of the cerebral organism. Speaking of kleptomania, for example, he writes that the presumptive evidence for brain disease is strong. It is, quote, often observed that pathological thieves have strangely shaped heads, as attested by the case of a rickety thieving boy, or that they suffered head wounds, as in the case of a man who begins to steal after trepanation. Comparing his use of cases for different disorders clarifies how narratives were used both to create and to solidify knowledge. While his chapter on the relative relatively uncontroversial at the time category idiocy spans only five pages and dementia 10 with few if any cases at all, Ray takes 67 pages to sketch out the nascent and contentious moral mania. Through sheer, sheer volume of case material, he works to prove that moral maniac is a kind of person who exists. Slide, please. To support the existence of total moral mania, for example, he includes seven cases that demonstrate his range of sources and the complex traffic of medical material. One from Pinell, one that Combe took from a historical source, a case from Metzger but found in Hofbauer, several cases from Pritchard, and one case that is an abridgment of six chapters of Lord Dover's Life of Frederick II. The rest of the chapter lays out case upon case to prove the existence of various partial moral manias like pathological theft, lying, eroticism, incendiarism, and homicidal mania. To work as evidence, case studies needed to appear not as subjective story, stories, but as objective data points from which to argue. This was accomplished in part through the creation of the fictionalized omniscient narrator that reports the observations of the physician, patient, and perhaps the patient's family or community as though from one objective vantage point. So to give one example, um, slide please. Ray offers a case by Dr. Michu that begins uh, a country woman, 24 years of age, of a bilious sanguine temperament, which is all very doctory knowledge, of simple and regular habits, but reserved and sullen manners. Um, potentially could be drawing on community knowledge here. It was common to interview family members and, and friends. Um, had been confined 10 days with her first child when suddenly having her eyes fixed upon it, she was seized with the desire of strangling it. The idea made her shudder. This, this is knowledge that could only come from her own testimony. So this case blends knowledge drawn from many sources into one omniscient, fictive narrator imagined to see all from a position of impossible objectivity. Alongside the fictional narrators are fictional patients. So in contrast to this catalog of cases that creates moral mania are different narratives that seem to mark the acceptance of a diagnostic category as entire classes of patients are compressed into one fictional composite that describes a type, what we might think of as the average of the case data that offers probabilities. So slide, please. Describing febrile delirium, for example, he writes, uh, the patient lies on his back, 
his eyes, if open, presenting a dull and listless look, and is almost certainly talking to himself in a low, muttering tone, regardless of persons or things around him and scarcely capable of recognizing them when aroused by his attendance, his mind retires within itself to dwell upon the scenes and events of the past which passed before it in a wild and disorderly array. Attributing specific details and accounts of interior mental life to a non-existent person, Ray outlines a pathological category by creating a character. Fictional characters com, um, have an obvious appeal for psychiatry. As Catherine Gallagher writes, fictional characters combine unreal knowability and apparent depth. She says, we seem to encounter something with the layers of a person, but without the usual epistemological constraints on our knowledge. Allowing writers to imagine away these constraints, fictional cases offered a supposed window to the interior mind. Slide, please. In an article for the American Journal of Insanity, Ray articulates the logic of using fictional narrative as data, arguing for the accuracy of Shakespeare's mad characters, which he claims are not, quote, copies, but real mortal men. Turning his diagnostic eye on these characters, he concludes that Lear is a maniac and Hamlet a monomaniac. This wasn't just entertainment, and the skills of literary genius were those the profession should cultivate. He writes, it is a curious fact that metaphysicians whose special province it is to observe and analyze the mental phenomena have shown much less knowledge of mind as affected by disease than writers of poetry and romance whose ideas are supposed to be the offspring of imagination rather than a sober observation of fact. The cause of this difference is obvious. The one looks at mind in the abstract, the other, the concrete. To become skilled in describing patients and understanding madness, Ray and his peers must hone their literary skills. Slide, please. At the heart of my interest in narrative as data in the formation of psychiatric science is the assumption that narratives can be effective vehicles for stereotype and bias. In a culture suffused with sentimental and gothic prose, supposedly objective medical cases very often resembled the work of authors like Edgar Allan Poe. If psychiatric science incorporates narrative and style and form as scientific and well-authenticated fact, it also incorporates and naturalizes racialized and gendered tropes of popular genres. Not at all surprisingly, what it means for a man to have erotic mania and what it means for a woman are entirely different. A white man's piety is a black man's religious mania. And Ray's narratives were imagined to illustrate not just minds, but bodies. A case study can incorporate a racist popular fiction like phrenology and make it as true as anything else. It's described from a position of neutral third person omniscience, it becomes equally true that a woman is 24 years old, that she hasn't had a period in two months, and that it's because of her reading habits. As tropes and stereotypes are woven into cases, the allure of narrative structure links together a convincing causal chain, imagining subjective and often biased observations as objective knowledge about the mind. And as these cases circulate internationally, they formed a shared database upon which physicians could draw in support of new theories and diagnoses. Especially when removed from their original source, this data is solidified. It's hard to argue an anecdote, but easy to repeat it. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much to all three of our panelists. Uh, these are wonderful and really uh, succinct distillations, I'll say, uh, from what I know to be big and ambitious projects. Uh, so I'm going to lead off with just a, a couple of reflections and questions for our panelists so that we can hear from everybody out there listening. Um, and I, I want to start by saying, um, I don't think it's controversial to say, that American society these days uh, is obsessed uh, with the promise and also the peril of big data. Uh, these papers remind us that this is not the only way uh, that we could uh, or perhaps should be thinking about the manifold challenges that data present to us. In these papers, we find not big data or small data, uh, we find bad data. We have dirty, uh, even dusty data. We have noisy data that need to be cleaned and smoothed into polished forms. We have data that are narratively uh, eclectic and sometimes quite literally fictional. We have data that are incomplete, incommensurate, or recalcitrant. Uh, data that can't capture the phenomena that they are designed to. 
we have data that are summoned from very different uh, kinds of sources, uh, physicians' observations as well as Shakespeare, uh, and we have data that must be disciplined um, by uh, quite a bit of invisible labor uh, to fit the needs at hand. In each case, of course, we're reminded uh, that data are deliberately crafted by human hands with different uh, scientific, institutional, cultural, political, uh, institutional, professional uh, agendas in mind. So uh, here's question one uh, for you all. Um, data are obviously marshaled uh, to solve and clarify various kinds of social and scientific problems, uh, from divining the weather to solidifying a psychiatric diagnosis. But uncertainty and ambiguity uh, run very deep in this process. Uh, we can think about this in the different ways that amateur observers versus professionalized ones tracked dust. Um, the need for technical expertise, layers of it really, uh, in cleaning data for scientific work and for the work of abstraction and theory. And we can think about it uh, in terms of which cases uh, and which elements of them um, became the kernels of new uh, generic psychiatric classifications, types like moral mania. I wanted to ask you all to reflect on when these instabilities in data production become visible and to whom. Uh, how are they solved? How are they made stable for use? And anyone can go first. <clears throat> I can, I can say something um, about sort of the stabilization, um, which is that I think in some sense, the appeal of explicit, that the larger project talks a lot more about explicitly fictional cases here. I was kind of trying to play with all the different ways narratives are working. Yeah. But I think the appeal of a, a fictional case is that it gets you out of the problem of whether or not something is true about a person, because you can just have whatever be true you need, um, that, a, that a fictional character is really stable and allows you, um, as long as you're attributing kind of verisimilitude to it, to, to really pin things down on it. Because if you do have, um, you know, if you have descriptive cases that are drawn from real life, things get a little messier. Um, and there's attempts to, to make that less messy. But I mean, it's really the most of the archives of psychiatrists that I've seen they have like folders stuffed full of newspaper um mm -hmm. that have all kinds of cases that are even like body jokes and things tucked in and they use them you can like track them through um their later work and i think that that's that's how they're stabilized is sort of by folding them in in either a, a medical lecture or um a book a text like Ray's. um is that they, they get equal footing, even if they were like printed on very cheap newspaper. Mm -hmm. They're now science. Wonderful. Do others want to respond to that? Yeah, I'll respond briefly. I think, um, I think one of the things that this question makes me think of is how these instabilities are used for resources as um, professional development and training. Um, one thing that's sort of interesting about data cleaning is that um, often if it's if it's ever talked about in something like a statistics course for a, um, a social science graduate student uh, typically it's talked about in terms of uh, one of a few famous examples of data cleaning gone wrong um, so there are these sort of well-known like sort of episodes when somebody published a finding and it turned out that they should have made the opposite conclusion because they cleaned the data wrong um, and so I think that that is sort of a that that sort of tells us something interesting about this the, um, the both the kind of thing that data cleaning is and the um, it, it, it sort of uh, it, it sort of makes clear that like uh, um, it's, you know, like what type of knowledge it is, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Just gonna add quickly that I think the, the instability, um, or for me, what emerges as bad data is more or less built into the system from the beginning. And it's sort of like the messy data, the bad data, the unclean stuff that allows for the you know the optimal data to emerge but it's it's different within each um scenario for example so in the 1930s um this land use crisis um gives stage to um 
a, a massive amount of material that's confirming the existence of bad data. In the 1850s, um, when the Smithsonian was um, running a national meteorological project that was entirely based in volunteer labor, they actually hired um, uh, school teachers who were predominantly women to clean the data. And there is um, a debate in that period of, uh, about whether or not that's good data. And that's connected to the fact of their identifying as, as women. And so I think that it's, um, that instability is sort of built into the system, but it's more or less visible at different times. Um, and someone had asked a really good question about like who was doing the volunteer collection. And so in the 1850s, um, there's a there's a wide variety of both men and, and women identifying folks, um, all all white communities. Um, in the 20th century, it's predominantly male and white. So there's a lot of um, different ways in which um, the those who are um, doing the data collection, the ways in which they identify, can also determine whether or not data is good or bad or clean or dirty. Mm -hmm. Terrific. I'm going to make this not a question, but an observation so that we can move uh, to some of the questions that are rolling in from people listening. But I did want to just point out that something is quite striking about this panel and about the work that all of you do um, is its interdisciplinarity. Um, this was visible, I think, even in your bios, right? We have a poet who is speaking to environmental science, a literary scholar, uh, who's working in bioethics around issues of psychiatric uh, definition, and a sociologist working on methods across the social sciences, including economics and psychometrics. Um, and I think this something about this foothold in multiple disciplinary spaces might um, really be an avenue to us understanding um, how different kinds of data are made in different domains, um, and, and it gives it a kind of visibility or a um, a, a tactile quality that uh, that may be really useful to us in thinking about processes of knowledge production. Um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have you reflect on that because I want to get to some of the the wonderful questions coming in. Um, I have one uh, from someone Tara Samra Graban um, who's asking from a data humanities perspective. Uh, we might think about data cleaning as data illumination. Uh, would you say this push away from cleansing to limbing as a principal methodology for social scientific data sets requires a greater shift in theory or in historical knowledge? So a big question there. Maybe thinking about different ways of whether cleaning is the same as highlighting or illuminating uh, or limbing. I think that's probably directed first and foremost at Alex, but others could jump in as well. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with the idea of data illumination. I'll have to learn um, more about that. But I think that um, I think that there is a sense in which the, um, the you know data cleaning is sort of an integral part of a larger system of knowledge production that has you know blind spots. Um, so you know social sciences and has been for a long time uh, largely about abs or uh, um, averages. Um, and not say like anomalous data points. Um, and so it's harder to think, it's, it's not only, it's not just that like um, there's our sort of theories are, are about averages and our methods are about averages, but it's also that we sort of would have a hard time thinking of like, how would you write, how would you even write up something that was primarily about say one anomalous data point, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any others with thoughts of different, I suppose, uh, ways that we might think about the process by which something more raw, though it's never, of course, entirely raw, right, become something more finished as data. Okay, um, we have a question um, from Adam Hughes, uh, who asks, with data being dirty, in quotes, and difficult to draw absolutes from, where do probabilistic calculations fit in? Um, so a question about uh, this, I guess, the, the statistical measures that maybe have been prompted uh, by uh, the fact that data are indeed uh, difficult to work with. They are, they are bad and dirty. <laughs> um, 
Anybody want to take this, that one? I, just, I don't think this question is for me, but I'll answer it anyways. Um, because I'm, I'm think one of the things that I was trying to think about a little bit as I was looking at these composite cases was that they were trying to capture probability in some sense. There's a ton of if then language mm -hmm. built into these everything where they're saying like, well, um, the person with febrile delirium, if this is happening, then this, if this, then that. And there's this like attempt to kind of capture, I mean, there's some of them that have this sort of one, rhetorically one figure that's having a hundred things happen to them, including the he menstruating at some point, um, because they just are trying to pack in all of the different possibilities. So there's this, there is a language of probability that's narrativized um, through these cases, mm -hmm. something that's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I have a question for that is directed toward Sarah Grossman, but I think it's actually one that um, anybody could speak to. Uh, and the question is from Hannah Turner. I'm curious if bad data or failed data that escapes stability and form becomes associated with kinds of people or the efficacy of certain individuals to collect and record better data over others. Uh, and I'm thinking here of the connection between the development of expert knowledge, uh, where some kinds of experts become more trustworthy than others. Sarah, do you wanna begin? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And um, I, I certainly see that in my work. Um, and I see that mostly as it relates to um, volunteers who identify as women in, um, in historical documents. Um, and that oftentimes their data is dismissed as bad or untrustworthy. Um, and I guess there is another way to think of this around the professional and volunteer um, science through, through the professional and volunteer science angle. Uh, and I would say that that um, line of thinking holds true there as well. At the same time, I would, I would also want to point out that um, volunteer meteorological records um, from settler communities form the basis of um, settler climate archives. And so while historically these might have been seen as less um, worthy records, they have in fact, um, you know, stood the test of time and uh, they're offering a lot of rich data contemporarily. Lindsay or Alex, do you wanna take that on or shall I move to the next? Okay. All right. Um, great. I have a question, a series of questions um, for Alex, uh, from Robert Hauser. Um, and here, here we go. Uh, exactly what is data cleaning? Is it removing wild codes or outliers or using well-developed statistical methods to impute missing data? or selecting subpopulations for specific analyses, or going back to original documents or interviews to clarify and correct codes. Is it truly the case that each of these data cleaning procedures has no established methodology behind it? Are they solely the province of research assistants whose work goes unrecognized? Where is the evidence here? Is recent research reported in the American Economic Review a sufficient body of data from which to generalize? It's a tall order, Alex. Yeah, thank you. That was, those are, that. <laughs> I think those are all great questions, and I'll try my best to um, answer them. So, um, so I think that those are all examples of something that I would recognize as data cleaning. And I think that um, I think that the case of imputing missing data is actually a really good example, um, because I think that uh, something that uh, there's a um, sort of thing that happens, which is where um, there's a form of data cleaning that becomes very important, um, and then it becomes sort of um, sufficiently sort of methodologized in, such that we don't see it as data cleaning anymore. Um, so, for example, um, in with respect to um, uh, with respect to imputation, the um, the sort of like industry standard now is multiple imputation, which is a form of um, which you know sort of requires uh, um, more sort of sophisticated sort of mathematical understanding of what's going on than simply say deleting all the observations where you don't have all of the um, variables filled in. Um, and so uh, 
that the, the in, in some sense, the um, I guess what I am sort of referring to as data cleaning is all those sort of things that don't get that same sort of treatment. Um, so with respect to, um, uh, with respect to whether they're, these are solely the province of uh, research assistants whose work goes unrecognized, I mean, um, I think definitely there's, uh, it's probably a little bit more nuanced than I, um, that I present, but I do think that there is a um, sort of significant sense in which um, data, uh, data sets, as, as particularly in the social sciences, are produced and maintained by people other than the, um, the, the, the sort of like canonical theorists of the field. Um, and and I, I think in a lot of in a lot of ways that um, was sort of a intentional design. Um, I think back to um, Paul Lazarsfeld's um, ASA presidential address in the '60s um, when he sort of declared this uh, the sort of model of knowledge production as a desirable future for sociology in particular. Um, and I think that um, with respect to the evidence, I, I wish that I um, had had more time to um, sort of talk through the, the data and have my approach in analyzing it. Um, but I use economics as an example in, in part because it's sort of the, um, uh, in many ways, the sort of mathematically dominant um, uh, sort of member of the social sciences. And a lot of its um, sort of standards for how you do math on social data have diffused into other fields. And um, so I think that, uh, that in the sense that the American Economic Review represents a sort of very sort of self-selected or um, sort of internally self-selected um, sample of work that economists find valuable, it's a good way of thinking about um, the kind of math that is, uh, is sort of dominant. Terrific. Um, I have a question here from Gordon Fraser, which is for Sarah, but again, um, I want to expand a bit to uh, say I think this could be for anybody uh, on the panel. I'm wondering a bit about uh, the capacity, how the capacity to measure dust shaped the desirability of measuring dust. So if we insert their moral mania or something like that instead of dust or what have you. Uh, I'm thinking along the lines of James C. Scott's thesis uh, in that landmark book, Seeing Like a State, does the capacity to measure in particular ways shape how dust or anything else uh, was understood and what it meant? Mm -hmm. So I think this is a question about the feedback loops um, between the interest in measuring something and, and what gets, um, gets measured or seen. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think the, the answer is yes, <laughs> that that feedback loop exists and my interest in knowing that and trying to bring that to the material that I'm studying is to look for the places of um, where things sort of fall apart. Because for me, that's a really interesting opportunity to wonder if there's sort of an alternate path somewhere. So for example, um, you know, some some uh, volunteer observers who were recording dust, you know, in their like sort of their entries, which span across the forum or in every category, I, I am inclined sometimes to read that as a, a way that they were actually grappling with the utter relationality of this crisis, but it wasn't the dominant narrative. So I guess part of the work is to look back and wonder at, um, to notice those feedback loops happening dominantly, but then to sort of trace out the, the minor moments <laughs> and to ask whether or not they have sort of um, maybe, if, if they might have had a more profound impo impact um, on consciousness, and if so, sort of like where that goes in the period. Um, I can't say that it really goes many places. Um, after the um, 1930 decade, um, for many reasons, and you know, some of them have to do with funding of the Weather Bureau, um, but also the emergence of forecasting. So uh, yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Other quick responses to that one about those loops? I, I was just in the in um, the launch of sort of in the, around 1830 that Penny Press and other kinds of um, quick publication I think is really changing um, some of the ways we think about psychiatry. So for example, like one of four or five different cases within this one text are the result of 
patients who have read a newspaper article and then about a woman killing a child and then were struck that they needed to do the same thing. So there's this sense that like things are already moving through these um, sort of print venues and that we need to then use that information, that that information is like providing us new insight. So there's something about like the more these kind of gothic narratives start to get um, spun through, um, the more we need to account for them. But then the more that we're using a kind of gothic interiority to describe the people that we're trying to classify. So there's, there, I think there's definitely some feedback. Okay, uh, I have uh, one question for everybody that I think will be our, our final question from the, uh, from the audience here. This is actually from Patrick Sparrow at the APS. Um, and he asks um, the panelists all to reflect on the kind of training that historians or historically minded scholars need to do in order to study scientific disciplines and practices. Um, what do you need, what kind of equipment, I guess, in order to allow you to study, analyze, and comment on these other fields? What kind of additional training do you need or have you done in order to undertake your work? It's a great question, I think, based on the, what I said earlier about the, the real interdisciplinarity and the challenges of that, um, that, that surface in these papers. I'll jump in there to say that um, I think that it is never not useful to connect with scientists whose work you're studying um, historically or, or someone who's working in a similar and allied field to try and get a sense of how they understand their keywords and sort of opening up dialogue and discourse um, around some of the more complicated, you know, areas. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess my, what I would offer is that um, dialoguing across disciplines can be really useful. Um, and uh, I've found that to, you know, I, I can't say I have um, any particularly special equipment, um, but I do tend to see that kind of dialoguing is really useful. Lindsay? Um, yeah, I would think just even in terms of, um, history and literature, the, the combination of those fields being useful for a project like this. I mean, I do think history of psychiatry um, sort of requires a literary, not requires, but like that there's, there's a lot more that will come out if you look at it through a literary lens. And at the same time, um, the class I was just working on this paper for um, was a history class um, and that is a, a methodological training that I don't really, you know, I, I have like cultural history training as a literary scholar, but, but not history, historian history. And it was just very interesting to see what kinds of questions they wanted me to answer that I hadn't mm -hmm. answered. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's a productive pairing. I, do, I have other thoughts about sort of um, working with scientists, but, but not, not for this paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll make a I'll make a quick plug for um, math and programming as sort of relevant forms of knowledge. I think that there's, um, I, if, particularly if you think of math and programming as sort of forms of theory by other means, um, I think that um, there's a there's a value in sort of understanding them sort of internally or I guess on their own terms in the sense that there's like all these sort of different connections that you see between things that otherwise would seem completely different um, if you didn't sort of have the that that sort of if you didn't sort of share that background with people. Wonderful. Um, I'm sorry that we were unable to get to some of the other questions that came in. I hope there will be other ways of uh, answering them. Um, a great question from a practitioner about their own practices of data cleaning, a question about sources and reading against the grain for Lindsay. So uh, lots of food for thought here. Uh, if I had more time, I would have grilled you all on what you, uh, based on your research and perspectives from doing uh, this research, uh, leads you to think about whether there is something that might be called good data, but we'll save that for another time. Uh, and I want to just close and thank all of our uh, 
our panelists for truly wonderful paper and insights, papers and insights. Uh, and also remind everybody out there listening that uh, we are not done for the day, that there is another session uh, that will roll out at 3 p.m. Eastern um, that will continue the conversation. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>